All right, everyone. So in this video, we will start doing some example problems to review for exam two. So the first example we'll look at is we'll look at the radial function for the hydrogen atom when it's orbital. Okay. And the question is, is what is the most probable distance of the electron from the nucleus in this function? Okay. So to answer this, we'll go to the next slide here. Okay. And for this, I'll rewrite what that function is. So our radial function is equal to 2 over a naught to the 3 halves power times e to the minus r over a naught. Okay. Right. In order to look at what is the most probable distance, we need to look at what the probability distribution function is for an electron in an orbital, right? And the probability distribution function, right, is related to psi star psi, okay? But in radial coordinates, right, right technically the probability of being in some space, some, some small amount of space is related to psi star psi times dx, dy, dz. So that's the probability of being in some tiny cube of space. Okay, so the probability of being inside this little infinitesimal cube of size dx, dy, dz is psi star psi. Okay, but in this case, we're using polar coordinates, spherical coordinates. So this is related, right, to psi star psi r squared dr d theta uh, psi d phi, right, and there's a sine theta thrown in here, right? Um, and so here we're, we're just caring about the radial part, okay? So what we're interested in is that radial distribution function, which is related to r star r, r squared, okay? And so that is our probability distribution, distribution away from the nucleus. And so in this case, we have, right, the most probable location, right, is related to so I'm going to call this P, right, is related to the derivative of P with respect to R and wherever that equals zero. That will give us the most probable location, right, because that is, um, <clears throat> right, where I have a minimum or a maximum of my function, right, and, and in this case, there's only going to be a minimum of, of this function, and so it will definitely, be, or sorry, it will be a maximum, right, there, there, there will be no minimums. Um, in this case, it goes from zero to some positive value back down to zero, okay? Uh, so there's only gonna be a maximum. And you can always plug in your final results to determine if it's a min or a max or things like that. But uh, but in this case, this will be a maximum that we'll find, okay? And so to solve this, right, I need to solve the derivative with respect to r of r squared um, <clears throat> times four over a naught cubed e to the minus 2r over a naught, okay? So I'm going to take the derivative of all of this with respect to r and set it equal to zero, right? So I got the 4 over a naught cubed from the fact that I have 2 over a naught to the 3 halves, and I'm squaring that, right? So this is just r times r is what this, you know, part is, and then r squared, right? So because I have two functions of r here, r squared and e to the minus 2r, right, I need to do the, the product rule or chain rule or whatever it's called, I always forget. Um, <clears throat> okay. And so this derivative, right, is um, going to be related. All right. Um, as follows. Right, I will take the derivative, right, um, of basically what I'm taking the derivative of is r squared e to the minus 2r over a naught, and setting that equals zero, right? Because there's a bunch of constants out in front, but those constants don't matter. I can multiply them through to the other side where zero is, and I'll be multiplying by, you know, zero by some number, just still just zero. So this is really what I'm trying to solve. So derivative of this function is related to, right, 
I'm just working out a little bit more detail, right? This is ddr of r squared times e to the minus 2r over a naught plus r squared d dr of e to the minus 2r over a naught, right, equals 0. Okay? And so in sum to these derivatives, this is 2r e to the minus 2r over a naught plus r squared times minus 2 over a naught e to the minus 2 r over a naught. Okay? And this equals 0, right? So I can simplify um, this a little bit, plot a factor of 2 uh, r, and I can have, well, actually, let's uh, pull out something else as well. So this is 2 r e to the minus 2 r over a naught times 1 plus Oh, no, this should be a minus. It should be 1 minus um, r over a naught equals 0. Okay? Right, so this is what our derivative comes out to be, and now I'm going to find out what value of r makes it 0. Right? Well, the values of r that um, make this zero, right? We, we see here, right? So let's change colors here. So there's, right, when, because of this right here, right, when r equals zero, I'll, my entire thing will equal zero, right? So I'll zero times a bunch of crap, which is zero, right? And then because of this function, right, when r equals infinity, right, this will go to zero, and then I'll have zero times a bunch of stuff, which will still be zero, okay? So, and that isn't really relevant. That, those aren't like the minimal maximums. Those are, I guess, kind of your minimum of your function, right? The minimum of this function is always zero. It's always positive, okay? So these are like minimums, so they don't really matter. So we don't really care about these two values, r equals zero and r equals infinity, right? So what we really are interested in is just this section right here. When is one minus r over a naught equal to zero, right? And that is true only when r equals a naught, okay? So r is equal to a naught is what we're looking at, right? And so that is the location, the minimum or the maximum location of, um, your um, 1s orbital, right? So where's the um, most probable location to find your electron? It's at a naught, okay? Which a naught is the Bohr radius, which is 0.0529 nanometers, okay? Um, <clears throat> right, and, and so that's what a naught is, is, is this Bohr radius, which happens to also be the most probable location to find the electron specifically in the 1s orbital for the hydrogen atom, okay? And, and it's equal to the permittivity of free space. So you know, I'll just write it here just for the heck of it, right? A naught is um, epsilon naught h squared over pi m e times the electric charge squared, okay? It's just a bunch of constants, right? Not that relevant, okay? Uh, but that ends up having to be the most probable location for the 1s electron, okay? All right, on to the next question here, let's sketch some wave functions. So sketch the wave function for a one-dimensional particle in a box. The quantum number is n equals four, okay? So, right, if I wanna sketch a wave function for a particle in a box, right, I need to know some things. You know, I need to know what are the number of nodes, Right, and again, I'm sketching the wave function, right? What is the general form? Right, um, of the wave function and, and, and things of that nature, okay? So the number of nodes for a particle in a box is the quantum number minus one, okay? And the general form is a sine function, okay, sine of x, right? 
So if I want to plot then this, right, I'm plotting psi of five, right? And equals five is what we were asked. Oh, n equals four, sorry. Not psi five, psi four. Sorry, my mistake here, psi four. Okay, right, yeah, e four, right? Uh, so I'm plotting psi four. Now, if you don't know what the function looks like, right, the function happens to be square root of two over L sine of four pi X over L, okay? But that's irrelevant, okay? We're, we just know it has a general form of the sine of X, and we know that there are a total of three nodes, right? N equals four means three nodes, right? So there's three nodes, right? Three locations where the particle equals zero. Those nodes happen to be equally spaced. They're always equally spaced from each other, okay? And so if I have three points in this box where I have to have a zero, right? Those three points are gonna to happen to be at uh, one fourth, one half, the length of the box and three fourths the length of the box, right? So that's where my nodes are, right? I mean, and again, it starts at zero at the edges of your box, okay? So we still got to start at zero at the edges of our box, and then we got to reach zero at these equally spaced points where there's going to be three of them, okay? And so then it looks at the sine function, so the function's got to go up and then down and then up, and then down, and then back up again, right? And my nodes are quite evenly spaced, right? Um, and you see, I tried to make the, the, the maximum values and the minimum values roughly the same, right? Because the amplitude, right, is just square root of two over L, right? And it doesn't depend on the location in the box, the maximum amplitude, right? So I tried to make that kind of the same, but again, the, it's not too relevant, okay? But what matters, you have equally spaced nodes, and you have three of them, and it looks like the sine function, so it's oscillatory. All right, so in this problem, we're gonna also sketch uh, another wave function, but here we're looking at the simple harmonic oscillator, right? And we're looking at the quantum number equals three. The number of nodes for a simple harmonic oscillator happens to just equal the quantum number, okay? V here, right? Um, and the general form of the wave function, right? The wave function for these are a little bit more complicated, but some polynomial, right? Whatever it is, times e to the minus x squared um, times some stuff or whatever, call it omega, I don't know, times some constant, doesn't matter, it has this this what's called a Gaussian function type form, e to the minus x squared, and then there's some polynomial out in front, okay? So that's kind of the general form of the wave function and the number of nodes. Now note here, we're wanting to plot psi star psi, so this will be positive everywhere, okay? All right, and so then to try to sketch this wave function, again, my number of nodes, really bad D here, but number of nodes equals three, okay? So these are gonna be located at one fourth, one half, and three fourths again. Okay, and my function, right, psi star psi will still have a rough form of a polynomial. And then it'll be still an e to the minus, you know, omega x squared, okay? So it'll still have some sort of exponential k. So some of the other things to note about the form for the harmonic oscillator wave function, right, is, right, it, we should be, as we get to higher and higher energies, we should be approaching the classical limit, which means that the probability, right, probability um, is larger at edges, okay? For the ground state, the prob maximum probability is right in the middle, but for uh, excited states, and as you get to higher and higher energy excited states, the maximum probability shifts out to the edges, which is where the most probable location is classically for some sort of harmonic oscillator, okay? And then we'll also note that in the harmonic oscillator, there exists some tunneling, so the wave function exists somewhat outside of your potential energy surface. 
and it has this exponential or this this Gaussian e to the minus x squared decay, right? So it'll go up. I'll have my maximum probability you know, edges. It does not go below zero because I'm plotting psi star psi here, right? And it'll go back up, right? And I'll have some looking form, and then I'll go back up again. And it should be symmetric around the origin. There's no reason for it not to be, so it should be symmetric around the origin, right? And so this is roughly what, right, psi 3 star psi 3 looks like, okay? Um, and so that's it for this first video on some example problems related with exam 2.